the possible and the real. I should like to come back to a subject on which I have already spoken, the continuous creation of unforeseeable novelty which seems to be going on in the universe. As far as I am concerned, I feel I am experiencing it constantly. No matter how I try to imagine in detail what is going to happen to me, still how inadequate, how abstract and stilted is the thing I have imagined in comparison to what actually happens. The realization brings along with it an unforeseeable nothing which changes everything. For example, I am to be present at a gathering. I know what people I shall find there, around what table, in what order, to discuss what problem. But let them come, be seated and chat as I expected. Let them say what I was sure they would say. The whole gives me an impression at once novel and unique as if it were but now designed at one original stroke by the hand of an artist. Gone is the image I had conceived of it, a mere pre-arrangeable juxtaposition of things already known. I agree that the picture has not the artistic value of a Rembrandt or a Velasquez, yet it is just as unexpected and, in this sense, quite as original. It will be alleged that I did not know the circumstances in detail, that I could not control the persons in question, their gestures, their attitudes, and that if the thing as a whole provided me with something new, it was because they produced additional factors. But I have the same impression of novelty before the unrolling of my inner life. I feel it more vividly than ever, before the action I willed, and of which I was sole master. If I deliberate before acting, the moments of deliberation present themselves to my consciousness like the successive sketches a painter makes of his picture, each one unique of its kind. And, no matter whether the act itself in its accomplishment realises something willed and consequently foreseen, it has, nonetheless, its own particular form in all its originality. Granted, someone will say, there is perhaps something original and unique in a state of soul, but matter is repetition. The external world yields to mathematical laws, a superhuman intelligence which would know the position, the direction, and the speed of all the atoms and electrons of the material universe at a given moment, could calculate any future state of this universe, as we do in the case of an eclipse of the sun or the moon. I admit all this for the sake of argument. If it concerns only the inert world, and at least with regard to elementary phenomena, although this is beginning to be a much debated question. But this inert world is only an abstraction. Concrete reality comprises those living, conscious beings enframed in inorganic matter. I say living and conscious, for I believe that the living is conscious by right. It becomes unconscious, in fact, where consciousness falls asleep but even in the regions where consciousness is in a state of somnolence, in the vegetable kingdom, for example, there is regulated evolution, definite progress, ageing. In fact, all the external signs are the duration which characterises consciousness. And why must we speak of an inert matter into which life and consciousness would be inserted as in a frame? By what right do we put the inert first? The ancients had imagined a world soul supposed to assure the continuity of existence of the material universe. Stripping this conception of its mythical element, I should say that the inorganic world is a series of infinitely rapid repetitions, or quasi-repetitions, which, when totaled, constitute visible and pre-visible changes. I should compare them to the swinging of the pendulum of a clock. The swingings of the pendulum are coupled to the continuous unwinding of a spring linking them together, and whose unwinding they mark. The repetitions of the inorganic world constitute rhythm in the life of conscious beings, and measure their duration. Thus the living being essentially has duration. It has duration precisely because it is continuously elaborating what is new, and because there is no elaboration without searching, 
no searching without groping. Time is this very hesitation, or it is nothing. Suppress the conscious and the living, and you can do this only through an artificial effort of abstraction, for the material world once again implies perhaps the necessary presence of consciousness and of life. You obtain, in fact, a universe whose successive states are, in theory, calculable in advance, like the images placed side by side along the cinematographic film prior to its unrolling. Why, then, the unrolling? What does reality unfurl? Why is it not spread out? What good is time? I refer to real, concrete time, and not to that abstract time which is only a fourth dimension of space. This, in days gone by, was the starting point of my reflections. Some fifty years ago, I was very much attached to the philosophy of Spencer. I perceived one fine day that, in it, time served no purpose, did nothing. Nevertheless, I said to myself, time is something, therefore it acts. What can it be doing? Plain common sense answered, time is what hinders everything from being given at once. It retards, or rather, it is retardation. It must, therefore, be elaboration. Would it not then be a vehicle of creation and of choice? Would not the existence of time prove that there is indetermination in things? Would not time be that indetermination itself? If such is not the opinion of most philosophers, it is because human intelligence is made precisely to take things by the other end. I say intelligence, I do not say thought, I do not say mind. Alongside of intelligence there is, in effect, the immediate perception by each of us of his own activity and of the conditions in which it is exercised. Call it what you will, it is the feeling we have of being creators of our intentions, of our decisions, of our acts, and, by that, of our habits, our characters, ourselves. Artisans of our life, even artists when we so desire, we work continually with the material furnished us by the past and present, by heredity and opportunity, to mould a figure unique, new, original, as unforeseeable as the form given by the sculptor to the clay. Of this work, and what there is unique about it, we are warned, no doubt even while it is being done. But the essential thing is that we do it. It is up to us to go deeply into it. It is not even necessary that we be fully conscious of it, any more than the artist needs to analyse his creative ability. He leaves that to the philosopher to worry about, being content himself simply to create. On the other hand, the sculptor must be familiar with the technique of his art, and know everything that can be learned about it. This technique deals especially with what his work has in common with other works. It is governed by the demands of the material upon which he operates, and which is imposed upon him as upon all artists. It concerns in art what is repetition or fabrication, and has nothing to do with creation itself. On it is concentrated the attention of the artist, what I should call his intellectuality. In the same way, in the creation of our character, we know very little about our creative ability. In order to learn about it, we should have to turn back upon ourselves to philosophize, and to climb back up the slope of nature. For nature desired action. It hardly thought about speculation. The moment it is no longer simply a question of feeling an impulse within oneself and of being assured that one can act, but of turning thought upon itself in order that it may seize this ability and catch this impulse, the difficulty becomes great, as if the whole normal direction of consciousness had to be reversed. On the contrary, we have a supreme interest in familiarizing ourselves with the technique of our action, that is to say, in extracting from the conditions in which it is exercised all that can furnish us with recipes and general rules upon which to base our conduct. 
there will be novelty in our acts, thanks only to the repetition we have found in things. Our normal faculty of knowing is then essentially a power of extracting what stability and regularity there is in the flow of reality. Is it a question of perceiving? Perception seizes upon the infinitely repeated shocks, which are light or heat, for example, and contracts them into relatively invariable sensations. Trillions of external vibrations are what the vision of a colour condenses in our eyes in the fraction of a second. Is it a question of conceiving? To form a general idea is to abstract from varied and changing things a common aspect, which does not change, or at least offers an invariable hold to our action. The invariability of our attitude, the identity of our eventual or virtual reaction to the multiplicity and variability of the objects represented, is what first marks and delineates the generality of the idea. Finally, is it a question of understanding? It is simply finding connections, establishing stable relations between transitory facts, evolving laws, an operation which is much more perfect as the relation becomes more definite and the law more mathematical. All these functions are constitutives of the intellect, and the intellect is in the line of truth so long as it attaches itself, in its penchant for regularity and stability, to what is stable and regular in the real, that is to say, to materiality. In so doing, it touches one of the sides of the absolute, as our consciousness touches another when it grasps within us a perpetual efflorescence of novelty, or when, broadening out, it comes into sympathy with that effort of nature which is constantly renewing. Error begins when the intellect claims to think one of the aspects as it thought the other, directing its powers on something for which it was not intended. I believe that the great metaphysical problems are, in general, badly stated, that they frequently resolve themselves of their own accord when correctly stated, or else are problems formulated in terms of illusion, which disappear as soon as the terms of the formula are more closely examined. They arise, in fact, from our habit of transposing into fabrication what is creation. Reality is global and undivided growth, progressive invention, duration. It resembles a gradually expanding rubber balloon, assuming at each moment unexpected forms. But our intelligence imagines its origin and evolution as an arrangement and rearrangement of parts which supposedly merely shift from one place to another. In theory, therefore, it should be able to foresee any one state of the whole. By positing a definite number of stable elements, one has predetermined all their possible combinations. That is not all. Reality, as immediately perceived, is fullness constantly swelling out, to which emptiness is unknown. It has extension just as it has duration, but this concrete extent is not the infinite and infinitely divisible space the intellect takes as a place in which to build. Concrete space has been extracted from things. They are not in it. It is space which is in them. Only, as soon as our thought reasons about reality, it makes space a receptacle. As it has the habit of assembling parts in a relative vacuum, it imagines that reality fills up some absolute kind of vacuum. Now, if the failure to recognize radical novelty is the original cause of those badly stated metaphysical questions, the habit of proceeding from emptiness to fullness is the source of problems which are non-existent. Moreover, it is easy to see that the second mistake is already implied in the first. But I should like first of all to define it more precisely. I say that there are pseudo-problems, and that they are the agonizing problems of metaphysics. I reduce them to two. One gave rise to theories of being, the other to theories of knowledge. The first false problem consists in asking oneself why there is being, why something or someone exists. The nature of what is is of little importance. Say that it is matter, or mind, or both, or that matter and mind are not self-sufficient and manifest a transcendent cause. In any case, 
when existences and causes are brought into consideration, and the causes of these causes, one feels as if pressed into a race. If one calls a halt, it is to avoid dizziness. But just the same, one sees, or thinks one sees, that the difficulty still exists, that the problem is still there and will never be solved. It will never, in fact, be solved, but it should never have been raised. It arises only if one posits a nothingness, which supposedly precedes being. One says, there could be nothing, and then is astonished that there should be something, or someone. But analyze that sentence, there could be nothing. You will see you are dealing with words, not at all with ideas, and that nothing here has no meaning. Nothing is a term in ordinary language, which can only have meaning in the sphere proper to man, of action and fabrication. Nothing designates the absence of what we are seeking, we desire, expect. Let us suppose that absolute emptiness was known to our experience. It would be limited, have contours, and would therefore be something. But in reality there is no vacuum. We perceive, and can conceive, only occupied space. One thing disappears only because another replaces it. Suppression thus means substitution. We say suppression, however, when we envisage, in the case of a substitution, only one of its two halves, or rather the one of its two sides which interests us. In this way, we indicate a desire to turn our attention to the object which is gone, and away from the one replacing it. We say then that there is nothing more, meaning by that, that what exists does not interest us, that we are interested in what is no longer there, or in what might have been there. The idea of absence, or of nothingness, or of nothing, is therefore inseparably bound to that of suppression, real or eventual. And the idea of suppression is itself only an aspect of the idea of substitution. There are those ways of thinking we use in practical life. It is particularly essential to our industry that our thought should be able to lag behind reality and remain attached, when need be, to what was or to what might be, instead of being absorbed by what is. But when we go from the domain of fabrication to that of creation, when we ask ourselves why there is being, why something or someone, why the world or God exists, and why not nothingness, when, in short, we set ourselves the most agonizing of metaphysical problems, we virtually accept an absurdity. For if all suppression is a substitution, if the idea of a suppression is only the truncated idea of a substitution, then to speak of a suppression of everything is to posit a substitution which would not be one, that is, to be self-contradictory. Either the idea of a suppression of everything has just about as much existence as that of a round square, the existence of a sound, flatus vocis, or else, if it does represent something, it translates a movement of the intellect from one object to another, preferring the one it has just left to the object it finds before it, and designates by absence of the first, the presence of the second. We have posited the whole, then made each of its parts disappear one by one, without consenting to see what replaced it. It is therefore the totality of presences, simply arranged in a new order, that one has in mind in attempting to total up the absences. In other words, this so-called representation of absolute emptiness is, in reality, that of universal fullness, in a mind which leaps indefinitely from part to part, with the fixed resolution never to consider anything but the emptiness of its dissatisfaction, instead of the fullness of things. All of which amounts to saying that the idea of nothing, when it is not that of a simple word, implies as much matter as the idea of all, with, in addition, an operation of thought. I should say as much of the idea of disorder. Why is the universe well ordered? How is rule imposed upon what is without rule, and form upon matter? How is it that our thought recognizes itself in things? This problem, which among the moderns has become the problem of knowledge, after having been, among the ancients, the problem of being, was born of an illusion of the same order. 
It disappears if one considers that the idea of disorder has a definite meaning in the domain of human industry, or, as we say, of fabrication, but not in that of creation. Disorder is simply the order we are not looking for. You cannot suppress one order even by thought without causing another to spring up. If there is not finality or will, it is because there is mechanism. If the mechanism gives way, so much the gain for will, caprice, finality. But when you expect one of these two orders, and you find the other, you say there is disorder, formulating what is in terms of what might or should be, and objectifying your regret. All disorder thus includes two things. Outside us, one order. Within us, the representation of a different order, which alone interests us. Suppression, therefore, again signifies substitution. And the idea of a suppression of all order, that is to say, an idea of an absolute disorder, then contains a veritable contradiction, because it consists in leaving only a single aspect to the operation which, by hypothesis, embraced too. Either the idea of an absolute disorder represents no more than a combination of sounds, flatus vocis, or else, if it corresponds to something, it translates a movement of the mind which leaps from mechanism to finality, from finality to mechanism, and which, in order to mark the spot where it is, prefers each time to indicate the point where it is not. Therefore, in wishing to suppress order, you find yourself with two or more orders. This is tantamount to saying that the conception of an order which is superadded to an absence of order implies an absurdity, and that the problem disappears. The two illusions I have just mentioned are in reality only one. They consist in believing that there is less in the idea of the empty than in the idea of the full, less in the concept of disorder than in that of order. In reality, there is more intellectual content in the ideas of disorder and nothingness, when they represent something, than in those of order and existence, because they imply several orders, several existences, and, in addition, a play of wit which unconsciously juggles with them. Very well, then, I find the same illusion in the case in point. Underlying the doctrines which disregard the radical novelty of each moment of evolution, there are many misunderstandings, many errors. But there is especially the idea that the possible is less than the real, and that, for this reason, the possibility of things precedes their existence. They would thus be capable of representation beforehand. They could be thought of before being realized. But it is the reverse that is true. If we leave aside the closed systems, subjected to purely mathematical laws, isolable because duration does not act upon them, if we consider the totality of concrete reality, or simply the world of life, and still more that of consciousness, we find there is more, and not less, in the possibility of each of the successive states than in their reality. For the possible is only the real, with the addition of an active mind, which throws its image back into the past, once it has been enacted. But that is what our intellectual habits prevent us from seeing. During the Great War, certain newspapers and periodicals sometimes turned aside from the terrible worries of the day to think of what would happen later once peace was restored. They were particularly preoccupied with the future of literature. Someone came one day to ask me my ideas on the subject. A little embarrassed, I declared I had none. Do you not at least perceive, I was asked, certain possible directions? Let us grant that one cannot foresee things in detail, you, as a philosopher, have at least an idea of the whole. How do you conceive, for example, the great dramatic work of tomorrow? I shall always remember my interlocutor's surprise when I answered, if I knew what was to be the great dramatic work of the future, I should be writing it. I saw distinctly that he conceived the future work as being already stored up in some cupboard reserved for possibles. Because of my long-standing relations with philosophy, I should have been able to obtain from it the key to the storehouse. But, I said, the work of which you speak is not yet possible. But it must be, since it is to take place. 
No, it is not. I grant you, at most, that it will have been possible. What do you mean by that? It's quite simple. Let a man of talent or genius come forth. Let him create a work. It will then be real, and by that very fact it becomes retrospectively or retroactively possible. It would not be possible, it would not have been so, if this man had not come upon the scene. That is why I tell you that it will have been possible today, but that it is not yet so. You are not serious. You are surely not going to maintain that the future has an effect upon the present, that the present brings something into the past, that action works back over the course of time and imprints its mark afterwards. That depends. That one can put reality into the past and thus work backwards in time is something I have never claimed. But that one can put the possible there, or rather that the possible may put itself there at any moment, is not to be doubted. As reality is created as something unforeseeable and new, its image is reflected behind it into the indefinite past. Thus it finds that it has from all time been possible, but it is at this precise moment that it begins to have been always possible. And that is why I said that its possibility, which does not precede its reality, will have preceded it once the reality has appeared. The possible is therefore the mirage of the present in the past. And as we know, the future will finally constitute a present, and the mirage effect is continually being produced, we are convinced that the image of tomorrow is already contained in our actual present, which will be the past of tomorrow, although we did not manage to grasp it. That is precisely the illusion. It is as though one were to fancy, in seeing his reflection in the mirror in front of him, that he could have touched it had he stayed behind it. Thus, in judging that the possible does not presuppose the real, one admits that the realization adds something to the simple possibility. The possibility would have been there from all time, a phantom awaiting its hour. It would therefore have become reality by the addition of something, by the transfusion of blood or life. One does not see that the contrary is the case, that the possible implies the corresponding reality, with, moreover, something added. Since the possible is the combined effect of reality, once it has appeared, and of a condition which throws it back in time. The idea imminent in most philosophies, and natural to the human mind, of possibles which would be realized by an acquisition of existence, is therefore pure illusion. One might as well claim that the man in flesh and blood comes from the materialization of his image seen in the mirror, because in that real man is everything found in this virtual image, with, in addition, the solidity which makes it possible to touch it. But the truth is that more is needed here to obtain the virtual than is necessary for the real more for the image of the man than for the man himself. For the image of the man will not be portrayed if the man is not first produced, and in addition, one has to have the mirror. That is what my interlocutor was forgetting as he questioned me on the theatre of tomorrow. Perhaps, too, he was unconsciously playing on the meaning of the word possible. Hamlet was doubtless possible before being realised, if that means that there was no insurmountable obstacle to its realization. In this particular sense, one calls possible what is not impossible, and it stands to reason that this non-impossibility of a thing is the condition of its realization. But the possible thus understood is in no degree virtual, something ideally pre-existent. If you close the gate, you know no one will cross the road. It does not follow that you can predict who will cross when you open it. Nevertheless, from the quite negative sense of the term impossible, you pass surreptitiously, unconsciously, to the positive sense. Possibility signified absence of hindrance a few minutes ago. Now you make of it a pre-existence under the form of an idea, which is quite another thing. In the first meaning of the word, it was a truism to say that the possibility of a thing precedes its reality. By that you meant simply that obstacles, having been surmounted, were surmountable. But in the second meaning, it is an absurdity, for it is clear that a mind in which the Hamlet of Shakespeare had taken shape in the form of possible would, by that fact, have created its reality. 
It would thus have been, by definition, Shakespeare himself. In vain do you imagine at first that this mind could have appeared before Shakespeare. It is because you are not thinking then of all the details in the play. As you complete them, the predecessor of Shakespeare finds himself thinking all that Shakespeare will think, feeling all he will feel, knowing all he will know, perceiving therefore all he will perceive, and consequently occupying the same point in space and time, having the same body and the same soul. It is Shakespeare himself. But I am putting too much stress on what is self-evident. We are forced to these considerations in discussing a work of art. I believe in the end we shall consider it evident that the artist, in executing his work, is creating the possible as well as the real. Whence comes it, then, that one might hesitate to say the same thing for nature? Is not the world a work of art incomparably richer than that of the greatest artist? And is there not as much absurdity, if not more, in supposing, in the work of nature, that the future is outlined in advance, that possibility existed before reality? Once more, let me say I am perfectly willing to admit that the future states of a closed system of material points are calculable and hence visible in its present state. But, and I repeat, this system is extricated or abstracted from a whole which, in addition to inert and unorganized matter, comprises organization. Take the concrete and complete world, with the life and consciousness it encloses. Consider nature in its entirety, nature the generator of new species as novel and original in form as the design of any artist. In these species concentrate upon individuals, plants or animals, each of which has its own character. I was going to say its personality, for one blade of grass does not resemble another blade of grass any more than a Raphael resembles a Rembrandt. Lift your attention above and beyond individual man to societies which disclose actions and situations comparable to those of any drama. How can one still speak of possibles which would precede their own realization? How can we fail to see that if the event can always be explained afterwards by an arbitrary choice of antecedent events, a completely different event could have been equally well explained in the same circumstances by another choice of antecedent, nay, by the same antecedents otherwise cut out, otherwise distributed, otherwise perceived. In short, by our retrospective attention. Backwards over the course of time, a constant remodeling of the past by the present, of the cause by the effect, is being carried out. We do not see it, always for the same reason, always a prey to the same illusion, always because we treat as the more what is the less, as the less what is the more. If we put the possible back into its proper place, evolution becomes something quite different from the realization of a program. The gates of the future open wide, freedom is offered an unlimited field. The fault of those doctrines, rare indeed in the history of philosophy, which have succeeded in leaving room for indetermination and freedom in the world, is to have failed to see what their affirmation implied. When they spoke of indetermination, of freedom, they meant by indetermination a competition between possibles, by freedom a choice between possibles, as if possibility was not created by freedom itself, as if any other hypothesis, by affirming an ideal pre-existence of the possible to the real, did not reduce the new to a mere rearrangement of former elements, as if it were not thus to be led sooner or later to regard that rearrangement as calculable and foreseeable. By accepting the premise of the contrary theory, one was not letting the enemy in. We must resign ourselves to the inevitable. It is the real which makes itself possible, and not the possible which becomes real. But the truth is that philosophy has never frankly admitted this continuous creation of unforeseeable novelty. The ancients already revolted against it because, Platonists, to a greater or less degree, they imagined that being was given once and for all, complete and perfect, in the immutable system of ideas. The world which unfolds before our eyes could therefore add nothing to it. It was, on the contrary, only diminution or degradation. Its successive states measured, as it were, the increasing or decreasing distance between what is a shadow projected in time and what ought to be idea set in eternity. They would outline the variations of a deficiency, the changing form of a void. It was time which, according to them, spoiled everything. 
The moderns, it is true, take a quite different point of view. They no longer treat time as an intruder, a disturber of eternity, but they would very much like to reduce it to a simple appearance. The temporal is, then, only the confused form of the rational. What we perceive as being a succession of states is conceived by our intellect, once the fog has settled as a system of relations. The real becomes once more the eternal, with the single difference, that it is the eternity of the laws in which the phenomena are resolved, instead of being the eternity of the ideas which serve them as models. But in any case, we are dealing with theories. Let us stick to the facts. Time is immediately given. That is sufficient for us. And until its inexistence or perversity is proved to us, we shall merely register that there is effectively a flow of unforeseeable novelty. Philosophy stands to gain in finding some absolute in the moving world of phenomena, but we shall gain also in our feeling of greater joy and strength. Greater joy because the reality invented before our eyes will give each one of us unceasingly certain of the satisfactions which art at rare intervals procures for the privileged. It will reveal to us, beyond the fixity and monotony which our senses, hypnotized by our constant needs, at first perceived in it, ever recurring novelty, the moving originality of things. But above all, we shall have greater strength, for we shall feel we are participating, creators of ourselves, in the great work of creation which is the origin of all things, and which goes on before our eyes. By getting hold of itself, our faculty for acting will become intensified. Humbled heretofore in an attitude of obedience, slaves of certain vaguely felt natural necessities, we shall once more stand erect, masters associated with a greater master. To such a conclusion will our study bring us. In this speculation on the relation between the possible and the real, let us guard against seeing a simple game. It can be a preparation for the art of living.